Administration and Congress. My name is Irene Spiro and I am the Chief Strategy Officer at COSIN and it is my pleasure to serve today as your moderator. The webinar is brought to you by COSIN as part of our continuing professional advancement offering. As many of you know, COSIN is the premier professional association of school system leaders. For 25 years, we've been providing these leaders with the management, community, and advocacy tools necessary for success. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, two extremely qualified and knowledgeable individuals who will help us navigate the complexities of our current policy context. Cheryl Afshir is a member of the COSIN board, chair of our COSIN policy committee, and chief technology officer in Calcasieu Parish Schools in Louisiana. Reg Lechte is founding partner of Foresight Law and Public Policy, and Policy is the legislative counsel to COSIN, and we work very closely with both Cheryl and Reg. Today, we plan to provide you with a snapshot of the federal outlook for EdTech, identify some of the key players, and note the EdTech and telecommunications policy priorities. And at the end of this webinar, we will respond to your questions, and I hope you will have many of them. With that, I will turn the mic over to Reg. Thank you, Irene, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I think most of you uh, that have been closely following the news the last couple of months know that this is a incredibly interesting time in Washington, and I think a particularly interesting um, moment for education technology policy. Um, and we're going to spend some time today talking about the different aspects of the federal education policy landscape, including, as Irene mentioned, uh, developments on Capitol Hill, but also uh, within the new administration, uh, including the U.S. Department of Education and the Federal Communications Commission, which have authority over the major education technology priorities that have been um, important to school districts um, over the last couple of decades. Um, we want to start with a really a high-level look, um, and then we're going to dive deeper into some of these areas um, over the course of the webinar. First, you probably know that the Senate confirmed on a party-line vote uh, uh, Betsy DeVos to serve as the Education Secretary. Um, that was, of course, a very important development, but um, there are still many political appointments that need to be made within the Department of Education, including some key ones, such as the leader of the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, and then also some of the uh, non-appointed positions across the agency that are very important and relevant to the ed tech community. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, and some of Mrs. DeVos's uh, priorities later in the webinar. Uh, we are uh, uh, beginning conversations, uh, COSIN is beginning conversations with leaders on Capitol Hill and at the FCC about a number of areas of importance, including E-rate and Lifeline on the broadband side. Uh, issues of student data privacy continue to be uh, uh, percolating on Capitol Hill in both the House and Senate. And of course, we are also um, really transitioning over the next couple of months into uh, uh, the annual push and pull over the federal budget, including investments in major programs like the new Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant that was created by ESSA and has a very strong education technology component. Um, we are uh, also working in a broader context, so I would just urge you as we walk through the details of some of these policy areas today to be thoughtful about all of the other issues that are on Congress's agenda. Uh, certainly there will be a lot of work in education policy in the education committees on Capitol Hill 
at the U.S. Department of Education and even to some degree at the FCC. But we also expect the House and Senate to really focus a lot of their time on other major areas of policy and particularly in the Senate with its filibuster rules. Time on the calendar is very precious so we don't expect any major education bills to move in front of the Congress um, this year but a lot of work will be done behind the scenes to set up um, changes in higher education, career and technical education and some other places that we really care about as education technology leaders. So we plan to dive into each of those um, uh, in a little bit greater depth over the over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I'm going to start off um, and if, if uh, Marcy if you wouldn't mind switching to slide six, uh, talking a little bit about the Department of Education. Um, as I mentioned, the White House is not yet uh, appointed or nominated people to serve in the major assistant secretary positions across the uh, agency. That's um, in part because it's a very, very big job to try to nominate the 600 or so most senior political appointees across the federal government and the White House is still uh, working hard both to staff itself, that is the people that staff the president in the White House and in the Domestic Policy Council, um, but also in trying to identify leaders across all of the agencies. Now that uh, Secretary DeVos is in her position, we expect in the coming weeks to learn uh, more and more about the people that will be working with her to implement uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and leading important offices like the Office for Education Technology. And we uh, you know, expect, particularly given the transition to full implementation of the Every Student Succeeds Act by the next school year as required by the statute, that the leader of the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education is going to be a critically important appointment. Um, we do want to just remind you that there are also important education executive branch leaders outside the Department of Education, including the staff that serve the President directly in the White House uh, as part of the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, that work is being led on the education side today by Rob Goed, who had been with the President on his campaign and prior to that had served Congressman Messer, an important member of the House Education Committee, as his legislative director. And Cosin will be working closely not only with Secretary DeVos and her team, but also Rob and others that are hired at the White House to work on education policy. Uh, transitioning to the next slide, uh, we want to highlight a few things that we expect to be in the near term uh, agenda for Secretary DeVos. First and foremost, as I mentioned, she will have to work hard in the coming weeks to coordinate with the White House and the Senate on confirmation of the other senior leaders of the Department of Ed, and that's going to take a significant amount of time, and I think they will spend uh, their initial efforts trying to staff the Office for Elementary and Secondary Education because by April, over half the states are expected to submit their Every Student Succeeds Act consolidated plans, which would begin the peer review process for those states. <clears throat> so having a uh, leader in place in the OESE office will be important for helping states complete their plans and begin implementation by the next school year. Beyond staffing, uh, she will also have to work closely with the Office of Management and Budget to identify President Trump's initial budget recommendations for the Department of Education. And this is important for the education technology community uh, because that process involves not only identifying top line budget numbers for the U.S. Department of Education, but also recommendations for each and every program, including the ESSA Title IV Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant, which is the replacement for the old Enhancing Education Through Technology program that had been authorized in no child left behind. And as COSIN and our peers in uh, the education community who are fighting hard for funding for that account um, continue their work this year, one point of entry for us will be working closely with the department to try to 
urge the administration to request um, an appropriate amount of money for that account. Um, beyond the president's budget request, uh, the Secretary DeVos will also then be tasked with working with Congress as the appropriations process unfolds on Capitol Hill. Um, and there are many uh, 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 budget priorities that are being championed by members of Congress this year, as in every year. And I think having a strong voice for the department's budget is going to be very important. Um, lastly, uh, I think you probably read, uh, particularly during her, the nomination process for Secretary DeVos, that one of her top policy priorities is promoting school choice that is a focus both on charter schools but also uh, potentially on systems like vouchers or kind of federal funding portability schemes that would enable students to leave low performing schools for other higher functioning institutions. We do not expect um, you know uh, that work to, to merge organically within the department. That's work she'll have to do with the Congress. Um, and that will likely take place over time, but could include EdTech conversations around virtual schools, course choice initiatives, um, and other issues related to um, online and blended learning approaches. Lastly, uh, Congress intends, and we'll talk more about this in a few minutes, to focus time on reauthorizing the Higher Education Act and the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, both with some implications for education technology. The secretary and her team at the U.S. Department of Education will be um, deeply involved in that process, providing information to Congress about existing programs authorized by those laws, but also as uh, um, you know, uh, providing important insight from the president's side in terms of what those laws should be look like look like when they're updated. So I'm going to pause there and hand it off to Cheryl now to talk about the Federal Communications Commission. Thank you, Reg. Um, can you hear me? I know we, we had a little bit of voice yeah. issues before, so delighted to be here this afternoon um, with the COSIN team and certainly with our audience. Um, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, in terms of um, the interest of ed tech uh, practitioners, uh, is is focused around certainly one of our premier programs, which is E-Rate. Um, the interesting thing about the FCC is there are uh, five sitting commissioners on the FCC based on the uh, the political party in power in the White House. When there is a Democrat, as we have for the last eight years, we have three Democratic uh, commissioners and two Republicans. Now we've had a change of party, and President Trump uh, and the Republican Party is in the White House, and so the 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 shift is there will be three Republican commissioners and two Democratic. However, in terms of what happens when an administration changes, uh, I think uh, Reg mentioned to you earlier, there's always um, a lag time. There are thousands of appointments that need to be made. And the FCC is uh, part and parcel of that. So while we have um, the new chairman, uh, Ajit Pai, a Republican, and Mignon Clyburn, a Democrat, and Michael O'Reilly, a Republican, all sitting commissioners previously, we now have two vacancies, uh, one Democrat and one Republican. And we have not yet heard anything about who that might be or when those appointments may be made. <coughs> Excuse me. Certainly this is important to us because the commission oversees uh, E-rate, it oversees the Lifeline program. We certainly all worked uh, very hard. We have the cap raised for E-rate. And so we are waiting with bated breath to see who those two new commissioners are and COSIN We'll be paying close attention to that and keeping our members and the EdTech community apprised of that. Um, Peter White, um, as part of the Domestic Policy Council, um, oversees the uh, Federal Trade Commission and the FCC. Again, another key player that sits in the White House that um, 
we will have contact with and hopefully communication with to help us move uh, our initiatives forward on behalf of our nation's children in our schools. So can we go to the next slide, please? Um, I know that um, as I've been speaking to people over the last uh, six to eight weeks, there certainly is a concern about, oh, things have changed in Washington, uh, shifts are taking place, and how is this going to impact our E-rate? Well, the short and quick answer is really no change now. But that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay attention. Um, you know, our current funding commitments and the filing window has just been released. Um, none of that will change because all of those decisions were made by the USAC board, approved by the FCC, and so things are moving forward. However, we should note that there are possible changes that could take place over the next few years. Um, any rule change to E-rate and the programs that are important to us require what's called an NPRM. It's a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. And so that allows the community and COSIN um, to advocate, to add information, to be a part of hearings, to file formal con comments about any changes that might take place that would uh, in any way impact our schools and libraries. The other thing I think that's important to note that we have seen, um, you know, concern, you know, in the media and certainly in different constituency groups around the country about executive orders that roll out of the administration. Well, one bit of good news is the executive orders don't apply to the FCC. So while that churn is taking a place in D.C., we're steadily, you know, reviewing our RFPs, uh, bidding, uh, filing our 471s now that that window is opened, um, and making sure that we have all of our processes in place to receive funding commitment letters as we move into late spring, early summer, and the fall. So we should be vigilant, but we should, um, you know, not have a high area of concern that things are going to change right now. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, while, while we are assured that things are moving forward right now expeditious, expeditiously, the, the long-term erect impact has a little bit of uncertainty. And, and here's a couple of points that, that you should pay attention to. Um, when the E-rate was reformed before, when we raised the cap, we had some changes procedurally. Uh, Chairman Pai was not in favor and did not support, um, you know, raising the cap. But, you know, uh, kind of a little, in a little bit in um, in a contrarian position, he did express support for broadband connectivity to our schools and libraries. But he but he shared with us that. All of this reform was going to make E-rate a little bit more complicated. And those of you that uh, are on the call uh, that have responsibility for E-rate in your district know that the changes in the form, the changes in the portal, uh, we've gone through a, a little bit of pain uh, in terms of that implementation that's come, a, come as part and parcel of that increased funding. So we're kind of sensing a mixed signal. Um, Certainly the chairman has shared with FCC staff that bridging the digital divide is a high priority for the commission. That's good news to schools and libraries. But yet they took action kind of unilaterally to roll back lifeline support. And we were celebrating this last year because this was our piece to kind of begin to erase the digital divide that would support low income uh, home access to the internet, families living in deep poverty. And so that, that action has been rolled back. So we've kind of got a lot of question marks over our head about that. Um, the other thing that we should, that's noteworthy is that we should know that the FCC is removed somewhat from White House, House politics, um, more so than the Department of Ed. But there's no doubt that any changes uh, in our nation's capital 
influence this independent agency because, as I shared with you, the commissioners are appointed by the president and serve at the pleasure of a sitting president. So there, the political influence is there, but it's a little bit different nuance than the Department of Ed. So if we can go to the next slide. I think that this is you, Reg. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. So yeah. Cheryl um, <clears throat> provided some really key insights about the core programs that we're focused on, but we do want to mention briefly a couple of other issues that will be on the FCC's plate this year, in part because I think they illustrate the philosophy of the new chair. Um, Mr. Pai has said very plainly in key proceedings over the last few years that he thinks that the prior commission uh, exceeded its statutory authority, that is the authority given to the agency by Congress in key agencies, and that it's his intention to try to ensure that the FCC's work is more narrowly um, focused on uh, the statute, the law itself, and that is going to become, I think, very apparent first with the FCC's work on uh, the net neutrality issue that was so prominent in the national press um, over the last couple of years. Um, the net neutrality rules that the FCC uh, is currently implementing were based on a, a, a pretty sophisticated sort of legal analysis about treating broadband carriers under some of the common carrier, that is the more strict rules of the FCC. Uh, Chairman Pai would like to shift uh, uh, back to a different, less prescriptive, less onerous regime of management in the broadband space. And that's going to have implications not only for the specific net neutrality rules, but also the recently enacted broadband consumer privacy rules that were um, championed by Chairman Wheeler last year. And i um, only briefly mention that on this same theory that the, that the FCC does not have statutory authority in all areas in which it was working, Mr. Pai has already begun to scale back some work that the agency undertook last year uh, uh, in the area of state you know, rates for, for calling outside of the prison system. Uh, and we also saw it last week uh, when he notified nine carriers that they would not be eligible under the national approval process for providing broadband under Lifeline. So not that you need to be aware of all of these other issues, but we did want to highlight this trend of moving to a more kind of narrowly focused uh, 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 interpretation of federal telecommunications law, which over the long term, is, as, as Cheryl said, could have some implications for our programs, but also to say there are other big, very big telecommunications issues on the Commission's plate that will consume a significant amount of time and attention, even as we continue to kind of vigilantly, vigilantly watch any work that arises on our programs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I do want to pivot to Congress. So even uh, kind of amid this sea change at the federal level, um, you know, there, there's quite a bit of continuity in terms of the congressional education policy leadership. Uh, the Education Committee in the Senate will continue to be led by Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee and Senator Patty Murray of Washington. Uh, they worked very well together in partnership to uh, help facilitate the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act um, in 2015, and we expect that. Um, um, them to continue working closely together on other issues during this 115th Congress. On the House side, um, it's really similar stability. So the former chairman of the House Education Committee, Mr. John Klein of Minnesota, has retired, but he's been replaced by uh, Representative Virginia Fox of North Carolina, who's a longtime member of the Education and the Workforce Committee, a very seasoned hand. 
Um, and on the Democratic side, Representative Bobby Scott of Virginia will continue to be the ranking that is the senior Democrat on the House Education Committee. So there's just a lot of uh, stability in that leadership, and I think we should expect them to play a very strong role in also the administration's policy work, given that um, you know they have kind of core expertise in areas that the Secretary has not worked in. Um, both Chairman Alexander and Chairwoman Fox have said that they are focused on reauthorizing the Higher Education Act. Um, that work is uh, considered somewhat tangential to the education technology community, but I think still very important, particularly around that law's focus um, on educator preparation. And I think there are opportunities for the ed tech community to be thoughtful about working with higher ed institutions to equip uh, new teachers with the knowledge and skills they need to effectively use technology, including more knowledge about how to effectively use data uh, to, to make decisions in the classroom. Um, and then there are also uh, some important programs funded by the Higher Education Act uh, like the college access and success programs, the gear up and trio programs that include some investments in high schools that I think provide some opportunities. So we'll see the education committees in the coming weeks spend a lot of time focused on HEA reauthorization. In addition, um, and most imminently, we expect Congress to take action to overturn two major regulations that were um, approved by the Obama administration in the last couple of months. The first uh, is the Title I accountability regulations for implementing the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, um, that rulemaking has already been disapproved by the full House and we expect the Senate to disapprove the regulation and send it to the President for his signature uh, in the next few weeks and that would uh, then require Secretary DeVos and her team to provide some uh, additional non-regulatory guidance to help um, support the implementation process. So look out for that in the next couple weeks. I mentioned earlier Congress is also planning to look at the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, uh, certainly an important source of support for education technology class uh, to support CTE classrooms across the country. Um, and um, Congress is also juggling some other issues, including an update to the Education Sciences Reform Act, which is the law that created all of the work of the National Center for Education Statistics and all of the research arm within the U.S. Department of Education. It's also the statute that created the State Longitudinal Data Systems Program. And then lastly, student data privacy continues to be an important focus area for key members of Congress, and that conversation, including a potential update to FERPA, could be connected to the higher ed reauthorization um, and some of the data questions that will no doubt arise in that um, discussion. Again, we do not expect either of these bills to move through the full Congress in 2017, but a lot of work will be done at the committee level and uh, potentially we could see final action on those sometime next year. Uh, next slide, please. The telecommunications leadership of the Hill has also been uh, largely stable with some real seasoned veterans leading uh, both of those committees, uh, the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation and the House Committee on Energy and Commerce have jurisdiction and authority over the E-rate and Lifeline programs through the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Um, Senator John Thune of South Dakota uh, and Senator Bill Nelson of Florida will lead the Senate Committee. Uh, Representative Walden and Representative Pallone uh, will lead the, the full committee on the House side. Uh, but important to note that Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee and Mike Doyle of Pennsylvania are the chairs of the Telecom Subcommittee in the House. Uh, both. Um, uh, Representative Blackburn and Representative Doyle will be key decision makers in uh, the debate over the future of, of communications law, including uh, important people for us to influence when it comes to E-rate and Lifeline. 
Uh, same for the full committee chairs for uh, the House. I did not list the subcommittee chairs for the for the Senate because much of the work of the Senate Commerce Committee happens at the full committee level. Um, so we'll stay on the lookout for communication from Tosin uh, about these committees work. Um, and I do want to highlight a couple of the issues on the next slide that they plan to uh, consider during the 115th Congress. Um, on the House side, uh, Representative Blackburn has said uh, she wants to spend some time within the committee focusing on updating the law that created the National Telecommunications and Information Administration within the Department of Commerce. Uh, key broadband programs over the years, including the Recovery Act programs, some of them were uh, operated out of NTIA. Uh, she's also mentioned actually reauthorizing and updating the FCC's work, and that would be looking at the structure and the mission of the independent agency. And then she has identified broadband expansion as a priority for her, and I think that's a good news because she said, should the Congress consider any uh, major infrastructure investment, which has been a discussed priority of President Trump, she is believes that broadband should be part of that investment, and I think that's important. Um, on the Senate side, uh, Chairman Thune has said he hopes to broker a deal on the net neutrality issue that I mentioned earlier in the FCC's work. Uh, he cares a lot about promoting uh, next generation broadband networks. Um, Communications infrastructure uh, and integrity, or emergency communications integrity, has been an issue for the chairman. And then uh, spoofing, fraud prevention, online, and privacy issues have also been priorities for the chairman. So, a lot of work uh, uh, in communications with some implications for ed tech, but you'll see not a clear focus on um, e rate and lifeline here, except to the extent that we might have an opportunity to fight for some additional resources if, if infrastructure becomes a priority of the Congress and the administration and there's a focus on broadband. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to turn back to um, uh, Cheryl now for slide 16. Thank you, Reg. Um, you've heard Reg and I talk about um, an overview of what's going on in Washington, D.C., and uh, the work certainly that Reg and the Coast and Policy Committee uh, is doing on behalf of our members and the ed tech community has been stellar. However, it takes a village, and it takes, uh, you know, more than the Coast and Policy Committee and certainly Reg. Reg's voice to be able to resonate with policymakers, and so one of the things we we hope that you will all do is um, make your voice heard. Um, we hope you will join the Coast and Advocacy Network. It is the best part about it. It is free and it is easy. Um, you see the link there. Uh, if that link is too long, you can just Google. Coast and Advocacy, and it will take you there, and you'll be able to sign up there. Um, you know, it, it, it does a lot of things for you. Here's what it does not do. It does not spam you. We will not send you emails every day. You'll receive them only on critical issues that um, we need you to think about. Um, stay, up to issue, stay up to date on issues that are important to our community. Um, you can make your voice heard as easily as clicking on a link that we will send you in an email that will have a, a pre-written message that you can add to or personalize, and then you can have that sent to your members of Congress, your two senators and your congressmen. And some of you may say, well, you know, really, why, why is this so important? Well, I think all of us know that as recent history has proven anything can happen in D.C. And I, and I want to hearken back to my previous comment about um, when the E-rate cap got raised. Make no mistake about it, that did not happen by accident. And it didn't happen, you know, God love Reg and Cheryl, but it didn't happen because we went and talked to a lot of people in D.C. It happened because of the ed tech community that spoke out and spoke up 
and raise their voices for the needs of uh, children in our schools and our libraries. And it, it was a joint effort led by COSIN that made that happen. Um, we should not take the E-rate for granted, even though everything's fine right now, because there is no doubt the, the winds are blowing and the new FCC will be uh, seated, you know, eventually, and there will be movement towards more E-rate reform. And uh, we as the community must have our voices a part of that critical conversation. So we need, we need to not rest on our laurels. Um, and we need to let Congress and we need to let the FCC know how important E-rate is and all of education policy is to the communities that we work in and where we live and the children that we support. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, if we think about what is another way to become involved or engaged, um, there's a critical group of ed tech organizations, certainly COSIN is the premier organization for ed tech leaders in school districts, but the State Ed Tech Directors Association, CETA, and the International Society for Technology and Education, uh, one of our partners, we traditionally hold an ed tech summit. And it's going to be this spring, May 11th and 12th. Um, it is a wonderful opportunity if you haven't done this before. Um, we will set up visits with your congressional offices, with your senators and your congressmen. Um, we'll have impaneled uh, groups from the Department of Ed, the FCC policymakers, and you'll get to tell them firsthand what's making a difference in your organization and speak out for the things that are important to you. So there is the link before to the EdTech Policy Summit. Again, if you probably just go to www.isd.org slash advocacy, you can link to there. Um, we hope many of you will join us there. We need you to join us there. But some of you may be, may be saying, well, Cheryl, that's great, but uh, I can't fly all the way to Washington, D.C., and our budget's or short, well, there is something you can do in your hometown and in your district, your organization. Um, every senator and every congressman have uh, regional staff offices that are staffed uh, by professionals that have direct impact and outreach to their member, uh, their congressman or senator. So we suggest that you reach out to them this spring would be a perfect time. Invite them to visit in your district. Tour them on some classrooms. Talk about the fact that if it were not for E-rate, um, you'd still be on dial-up or perhaps with two Campbell soup cans and a string uh, trying to have communication in your district. Um, many policymakers do not understand the critical mission that this federal funding plays in building and maintaining 21st century opportunities for our young people in our schools. So, I, so there's something you can do at home, and being on this call is a first step. And the next step would be invite some policymakers. They'll be going on break, and give them a photo op. Give them an opportunity to be able to have their picture taken in a classroom or uh, with a kids with a bunch of tablets and uh, talk about how supportive they've been and what the difference they've made. And their, uh, their staff people out in the districts welcome opportunities to set up these kinds of uh, meetings. So I think we're going to turn it over to Irene now, and I, I, I hope we have some questions. Irene? So thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Reg, for that incredible walkthrough of the complexities of our current policy situation here in Washington. Uh, and I see some questions that have come in, so I'm going to uh, start uh, asking them directly to you. So one question uh, from one of the attendees said, I'm confused. Executive orders do apply to the FCC. There have been even some in the past that only were directed at the FCC. It is an executive branch agency, for example, the current executive order hiring freeze impacts the FCC. 
So, um, Reg, would you like to take that question? Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to. Um, Irene and and uh, questioner has uh, you know stumbled on an issue that legal scholars and a lot of second year law students wrestle with. Um, the distinction between an independent agency and uh, uh, other executive branch agencies is um, not uniform, and I think trying to think about it in a binary way uh, wouldn't do it justice. That is to think about all of them as executive agencies, but along a continuum of of kind of less independent to more independent with the independent agencies having um, some special characteristics like uh, bipartisan composition in their leadership like the FCC. There are strict, more strict rules around removal of the uh, leaders of those agencies for cause. Um, but in many ways they are similar to um, other executive branch departments um, and so always I think good to keep in mind that the White House does have influence particularly through the chairman of those independent chairwoman or chairmen of those agencies who who lead them and uh, if you want to read more I'm glad to glad to send any kind of follow-up articles to people that would want to kind of dive deep into the legal minutia about that really interesting question. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. The U.S. Department of Education's website for information on the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act has been down for several weeks. Two senators recently sent a letter to Secretary DeVos asking for it to be made available again since it contains very important guidance for teachers and administrators and parents. Do you have any update on this situation? Is there any indication so far um, what Secretary DeVos intends to amend in IDA in some way? So there are two, two questions there. Um, I mean, the first is on this you know, disappearance of all that information on the website. The department did put out a statement, and I think it came off the website coincidentally around the time that her nomination went through, but the department did put out a statement indicating that it was not taken down as a matter of policy, but that they had some significant technical glitch with the site. Um, that's the official statement of the department. Um, I think if you look at the website, you'll see that it's um, not a great one. I think there's a lot of work underway to try to uh, create an updated version. I don't have a lot of insight into when that information will be back up, but I, I think we should expect it to come up. Second, the more important question of what, if any, changes the new secretary might champion um, with regard to IDEA. Um, remember that uh, she has pretty significant limitations on what she can do as secretary and that does not include uh, independently changing uh, the, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Right, That's work that would have to be done with Congress. We don't expect Congress to take up IDEA uh, this year or next. It's in the queue but behind HEA, CTE and some of these other major federal laws um, she does have responsibility for implementing it, and that became a point of controversy after her nomination hearing. Um, but uh, in most instances, the um, statute is pretty clear. and We've gotten no indications from the Secretary or anyone in the White House that they intend to pursue any regulatory changes related to IDEA. So I think that's an area like, a, like, frankly, much of the administration's education portfolio or we'll have to watch and see what they do, but it hasn't yet really been a stated kind of area of focus. Okay, thank you. So, um, keeping on that same theme of disappearing uh, things from websites, uh, do you know what motivation was for the FCC to pull the progress report for the E-rate modernization order?
Um, so um, it's a good question. So there was at the time of the sort of immediate transition on January 20th when uh, the federal uh, uh, all federal regulations were frozen, uh, which is pretty. Oh, I'm sorry, not all federal, but all recently promulgated federal regulations were frozen. That's pretty common when a new president takes office. And I think there was a movement in some uh, parts of the executive branch to also um, stop some of the non-regulatory guidance and other materials that were put out. Um, it's not clear why the E-rate progress report was taken down. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the report, it largely in the first half talked about some kind of key um, progress, and the second half had some kind of policy uh, voice in it, and it might have been that latter part that the new chairman, um, you know, did not agree with philosophically. They didn't say. So I guess, you know, it's uh, again, I think another reason to watch closely what he intends to do over time with the program, but also probably not something we should um, dwell too much on until we learn more about the direction of the new chair as it applies to E-Rate and Lifeline and other programs. Okay, another question on the E-Rate. What's the fastest that the FCC could change the E-Rate program? and by what process so as to reduce E-rate funding, for example, to remove funding for Category 2? Oh, e uh, Reg, it's a Cheryl. I want, I want you to get your crystal ball out of that little clock that uh -huh. you keep it in. <laughs> um, yes, this is time to polish off the crystal ball. Yeah, so Cheryl talked a little bit earlier about the you know, the formal regulatory process. So major changes to E-rate would, um, you know, have to go through a notice and comment period, that notice of proposed rulemaking that, that Cheryl um, talked about earlier, which would provide typically a 60-day window for uh, public feedback. And um, there would be considerable work within the agency to tee up um, a rule like that, including kind of direction from the commissioners to staff to undertake that process. Um, on the funding side, you know, the caps were uh, raised in uh, and as part of the, the regulatory changes of 2015. That is, they went through notice and comments. Um, E-rate uh, is supported, of course, through fees on international um, and interstate telecommunications, including a levy that takes and allocates a portion of wireless communications to international and um, long distance. Um, the FCC, uh, on a quarterly basis, uh, assesses a contribution rate on consumer phone bills to generate the revenue required for E-rate and other USF programs. Um, so there is some authority uh, within the program to ensure that the funding flows in a kind of systematic and stable way. I don't see, although um, probably, you know, uh, kind of merits a lot of additional research, that the caps themselves could be adjusted without full commission action based on a notice of comment rulemaking. So that's a really long way of saying um, there's not an overnight way for, um, as far as I know, <clears throat> you know, commission at the, let's say, at the bureau level without uh, the input of the, of the commissioners to, to make that change. Is it an area that we watch closely? For sure, because um, you know, it's very possible that the new majority on the commission does not support the caps at the level at which they're set. And the only thing I'd add, Reg, is <clears throat> I think you made a very valid point that um, in some ways there's some uncertainty because while the notice for proposed rulemaking takes a certain amount of time input and consideration, the contribution rate 
um, is decided quarterly. There's a recommendation by the USAC board, and then the SCC makes that decision. I don't think we've been signaled in any way that there would be a change in that, but we do have we don't have a full commission sitting. We have a new chairman, and so I think, as we've said throughout this webinar, um, we all need to remain vigilant and informed and engaged because these are all decisions, uh, policies and procedures that are critically important um, to the future of our schools and libraries and uh, not only at the department level but at the commission level and uh, I just, I don't, I don't think we can say unequivocally 100% nothing will happen. I think we have to say we, we're not being signaled about this but we want to be vigilant. Yeah, and I should have mentioned, that's a really good point, Cheryl, that after the E-rate report was withdrawn from the FCC's website, uh, the ranking member of the Senate Commerce Committee, Mr. Nelson, sent a letter to Commissioner Pai, Chairman Pai, um, saying very plainly, we intend to hold you accountable for this very valuable program. Um, and I think it was a strong signal that key members on the Hill will be watching very closely. And I think you can download that letter from the COSIN website, and I think it's worth reading. And we've seen a couple subsequent letters sent to the Commission, first by 15 senators, and then today by 40 members of the House, uh, questioning um, uh, where the Commission's going on Lifeline. So. We've, we talked about the White House push and pull on the FCC. I think there's a lot of congressional push and pull um, as well. So, Rich, that um, I think leads to a really good question. We've been talking a lot about, um, Cheryl has talked about how we can uh, be an advocate, and most of that is focused in on how we could be an advocate with uh, members of Congress. But certainly we've also talked about the importance of FCC to the issues that we're facing. So what are some ways uh, for school district leaders and school system leaders to influence FCC decisions? Well, well um, this is Cheryl. They all have a Twitter account. <laughs> and they all have email. So um, I certainly think I know that when we, you know, we have a district Twitter account, when we tweet out successes or upgrades or things that have happened, we frequent, I frequently um, add the commissioners um, to that tweet. Um, and it's always, I think it's always important um, to try to win friends and influence enemies. So it's always in a positive note. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I don't. I don't think sometimes that we get what we want and need if we are always critical. So I always try to add good news and thanks to at FCC and thanks to at um, you know Commissioner Pye's uh, Twitter account. We certainly. Um, I think reaching out to them in terms of email. And keeping them because you know, although Reg and Irene do live there in D.C., um, the majority of their constituency lives outside the Beltway, and I think sometimes there can be a um, a lack of clear understanding um, of what happens in rural America or down in the Bayou here in Louisiana or a big urban setting, maybe on the west or the east coast. So I just say I think. I think I think it's part of our job to keep them informed and to keep their feet on the ground in terms of what's really going on in our schools and libraries and um, and what's important to us. And you know, if they don't hear from us, then they use their own judgment, their own perceptions. You know, and I would add to that, Irene, that in addition to those important direct communications with the FCC. I think it's really important for school district leaders to develop relationships with their members of Congress, with their two senators, and the staff that serve them on education issues, um, because uh, 
communication from home, right, all politics is local, that says the E-rate matters to me, the new Lifeline Homework Gap Initiative matters to me and my mm -hmm. kids. Uh, I want you, as my member of Congress, to let the FCC know that those programs are working, that they're successful, and that they're helping students. That's really important because that's where these letters that we've seen come from, right? From Chairman Nelson, or I'm sorry, Ranking Member Nelson, and from the many members who weighed in on Lifeline, they recognize that these programs are important for their state. And I think school district leaders need to be part of the voice from home saying that. So write an email, or better yet, call your member of Congress and then call the two senators and say, I care about these programs, or send them an email, you know, or go to a town hall. You know, they need to know that these programs matter to people back home. Well, with that, um, thank you so much, Reg and Cheryl, for your sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. Um, I think it's clear that we live in uh, uncertain times. There are a lot of unknowns that a crystal ball would certainly help, uh, but that throughout this process, we should be informed and up to date and most of all engaged and have a strong voice. Uh, with that, I want to just uh, continue our conversation uh, and invite all of you to attend our uh, 2017 annual conference, April 3rd through 6th in Chicago, Invent the Future, uh, it's going to be fascinating uh, discussions. and. Um, I think you will be able to see and hear from Reg and Cheryl um, during that conference as well, and perhaps we'll have some updates. And then finally, uh, just to thank all our sponsors, our corporate sponsors um, at the platinum, gold, and silver level who make it possible to bring you these webinars. So with that, thank you so much, and uh, I hope this was helpful. Thank you.